<clears throat> Psalms 46. I appreciate you being here with us today and I think Dick, you and Donna are going back this week, right? Good to have <clears throat> Carolyn Merrillis, the sister Donna and her husband Dick with us. They're, they're an extension of our family. They live up in New York, but they're an extension of our family and it's always good to have them here and we sure love y'all and pray for God to keep you and bless you as you go. And we'll see you again. <clears throat> Psalms 46. <clears throat> Verse 1. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Father, we thank you. I thank you for every prayer you've answered already today. I thank you that we have the freedom in this church to worship you and we're not hindered by what others think. This is your house. This is your service. We're here, Lord, to abide in you and through you. And I'm grateful that we can worship together, that we can pray together. I'm thankful that we can have the freedom to do what you lead us to do. Now, God, I ask for that same freedom and I ask for that same power to guide and direct me as I share the word today. Help us to receive it. Thank you for what's going to happen. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> now, I want to encourage you up front today to listen to God's word. <clears throat> I want this to be a sermon today where each of you take it individually. Do not worry about the person next to you. Do not be concerned about what they're doing. But you'll just let the word speak to you. And I'm talking about from the youngest in here to the oldest. Let the word speak to you today. The Bible tells us where we just read <clears throat> that God is our refuge, he's our strength, and a present help in the time of trouble. Now with that being God's word, this is what David has said, have you ever had the time in your life where you didn't feel like God was your refuge? That you didn't feel like he was around and therefore refuge is a place that you go into for safety. And you wondered where God was? You ever had a time in your life where you were so weak spiritually and physically that you didn't know if you were going to make it tomorrow or not? Ever been to the place where you thought death was imminent and you didn't know if you were going to live tomorrow? You ever been in a place in your life where God was not a present help? That you ask questions about why? God, why did you allow this to happen? Where were you, God, when all this I was going through? I've been faithful to you, God, all these years, and where are you now? Is this what I get because of my faithfulness and kindness to you? A place where you just didn't feel like God was your present help. Present help means now. I don't need it tomorrow, now. Amen. Ever been there? And I will tell you, every one of us have. And it's very interesting that this psalm takes place after the one we're going to actually look at today. <clears throat> David is saying at this point in his life, my God is my strength. He is my refuge and my present help in time of trouble. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now I want us to back up. Psalms 38. And I want you to see why David was so thrilled in his praise at this moment for what was going on in his life. 
See, it hasn't always been that way with David. There were times when God was not his refuge and God was not his strength and God was not his present help in time of trouble. So he's praising him there in that one, but now let's look back here and see what he says. O oh Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. In Psalms 38, verse 1, David sets this whole thing up. David has committed some kind of grievous sin. Bible scholars tell us that they're not really sure. They're not, they, don't, they don't think it, whether well, they know it was at the time that he had sinned with Bathsheba. Even though we're quick to point that out, that that may be the very case. But they don't think that's it because of some of the language that David uses. What the occasion is does not matter. What David says does. David had committed some kind of a grievous sin. He had done something wrong. All of us have been there. But David uses this psalm, maybe not on purpose, but he uses this psalm to help us understand something about our own lives. He is not preaching to us in this psalm. David at this moment is reaching out to God because David is in a desperate, desperate situation. He doesn't feel God. He knows he's not safe in the arms of God. In fact, he thinks he's fixing to die. He's been suffering for a good while. And where is God? And David now begins to bring it out for me and you. We're going to look at it as his word to us, even though it was not the intended purpose. It was David's cry unto God, and he says, O oh Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. What was God displeased with? David's sin. How displeased with it was God? David is crying out, God, don't bring your wrath upon me. Most of us today don't even know what punishment is because we have learned that a little spank on the hand is enough. I'm, I'm from the old school. Mother held my hand, but she tore up the other part. We don't do that anymore messes our children's minds up. Yeah, well, look at, the, look, at, look at the nation like it is today and tell me what messed that up. <clears throat> a lack of discipline. A lack of discipline. This is not about discipline, but a lack of discipline. We just tap on the hand now and the baby cries so loud we think we've heard them and we stop. We haven't heard them. They're just smarter than we are. <clears throat> so, we, <clears throat> so we allow them to go on and do their thing. We don't know what punishment is. And because we don't know what punishment is, we don't know how to mete it out anymore because we've been told psychologically it ruins people. <clears throat> psychologically, it ruined me too. Because had it not been for what they did to me, I would have been living in sin today. It ruined me. It ruined me. Thank God it did. It ruined me with sin. It ruined me for my, for my love of sin. It ruined me for my having my own way and it taught me there is another way, a better way, and that way is God's way. Thank God that it ruined me. Amen. But we don't know what it is. And since we're so lax, I had a helper tell me one time, he said, I can go out and rob somebody if I want to and the court won't do a thing to me. I said, really? He said, yeah, I'm a first offender. I'll be out of there in no time. That's the kind of life we live. You don't believe it. You look at our jails. You look at the people that's being killed, the people that's being hurt. You look at it. It's rampant all across America and the world. Life means nothing because we'll be out in no time. No big deal. I can take prison. No big deal. Really? We don't know what punishment is. So when God talks about punishment, it's no big deal. We don't have to go to church if we don't want to. 
We don't have to. <clears throat> we don't have to come to church on Sundays. <clears throat> we can go somewhere else. No big deal. We don't have to come to church on Wednesday night. It ain't no big deal. We can go hunting. We can go shopping. We can go fishing. Ain't no big deal. It don't mean anything. See, we, we, we now are living a life where we don't know what punishment is because God hasn't done it. So we've grown callous to it. The only thing is, in the end, God will prevail. In the end, God's word is going to be true. In the end, this is what we're going to be judged by. Stephen said this morning, one day we're going to stand before God and take our crowns off and place them at his feet. That doesn't mean a thing to us. Oh, we said amen, and we said all that a while ago, and I understand that, but it doesn't mean anything to us, because tell me what that means. You think everybody in heaven is going to get a crown? The Bible talks about six or seven crowns. You earned them. But for us to take them and place them at Jesus' feet, that's no big deal. It paints a beautiful picture. That's what we get excited about. But it's no big deal. And the reason it's no big deal is because we don't worship him here. <clears throat> I'll go ahead to begin with. If the shoe fits, wear it. If it doesn't, don't worry about what I'm saying. Do worry about it. Do worry because your heart could change. We don't worship God here. What's the big deal about us worshiping God there? We don't even do it here. You see what I'm saying? I was, I was listening to them sing this song this morning. My God is faithful. My God is truthful. And we amen that. And he is. My God is boldness. <clears throat> is boundless in all he is. My God is wisdom. My God is righteous. My God is vision for all who seek him. If that's true, why don't we live for him? If all that's true, why don't we live for him? My God is power. My God is glory. My God is ruler over all that is. My God is timeless. My God is justice. My God is mercy to the oppressed. Then why don't we serve him like we should? If God knows everything, sees everything, and he's going to mete out his justice to us, why do we still sin? Because we don't call it sin. Understand that? We don't call it sin. When God says, gather yourselves together, and we don't gather ourselves together, that's not sin. Because we've changed the words. His name is love, but his voice is thunder. Isn't that interesting? See, I get a different picture, I guess, than you do. God is love, but his voice is thunder, and we better hear it. Because even though he's love, there will be justice in the end. Count on it. His heart is tender, but his hand is strong. He will deliver justice. God will do exactly what his word says he will do. And we need to learn today to love God. I will worship you in the beauty of holiness. I will worship you. We worship him. We raise our hands. We come here and sing songs. And we, we, we worship him, but not in the beauty of holiness. We worship him the way we want to worship him by coming in here on Sundays, saying something great, doing something great, you know, and then go out there on Monday. Never do it again until we get back in on Sundays. See, when you do it in the beauty of holiness, it's a thing that's within you, and it's always there, always coming forth. Amen. And when my life's complete, I'll place my crown at your feet, and I will worship you on bended knees. We, we even have a problem just standing here. I know there's some of you that can't, but there's some of us that just won't. We have a problem standing Yet we're going to put our crown down at his feet and fall on our knees and worship him? Yeah, because when I get to heaven, I'm going to have perfect health. Really? You won't have perfect health in heaven if you don't learn how to worship God in bad health here. Amen. Now let's get back to the sermon. <laughs> David says here, O oh Lord, rebuke, uh, rebuke me not in, my, in your wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. David had sinned. He knew he was in trouble. 
And all of a sudden, he comes to his senses. How long this lasted, we don't know, but it had been a good while. Now David comes to God and he says, God, please, whatever you do, don't reject me in your wrath. We don't believe God will reject us. But I promise you, he will. There will come a time when God will withdraw his spirit from you. And when God withdraws his spirit, you can never be saved. Because it's the spirit that draws you unto salvation. Saul, the king, he understood that because the Bible plainly states that God withdrew his spirit from Saul. He was displeased with Saul. And he withdrew his spirit. And Saul's final end was committing suicide. We better understand that God's wrath will come to those who reject God. And I'm not talking about those violent sinners who go out there and blow people up and shoot them dead and all that kind of us. I'm not talking about those adulterers and those addicts and all those kind of things who ain't God. I'm not talking about all those people who never come to God's house. I'm talking about God's people. Now, if you think I'm joking, go back and read about God's people in Israel. You refuse to accept me. You refuse to worship me. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll withdraw myself from you. I'll allow the Babylonians to come and capture you and they'll take you off to captivity and you'll stay there 70 years in, in pure prison. But I promise you this. In 70 years, you will know my name. In 70 years, you will worship me. In 70 years, you will bow down when you see the justice of God. And it came true. Oh, what did they say? Oh, while we're in bondage, our hearts are broken. We're so far from God, he doesn't seem to be here. Oh, we have taken our harps and we've hung them in the trees because we no longer have a song. Yeah, they didn't have a song. They felt alone because God had withdrawn himself. He still loved them. But God's voice will be heard over the world's voice because it's like thunder. And God's hands will be strong to mete out justice because he said he would. And we've got to be in reality to all these things today. David said, God, listen, I understand I've sinned. David's whole condition, his whole condition in this chapter was because of sin. Now, I want you to think real hard. <clears throat> I want you to listen to what he's saying because I don't believe we believe this. O oh Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. I know you're displeased with me, God, because I've sinned. Please, God, don't punish me. Don't punish me while you are having this great displeasure. Because David understood his reward should be for God to beat him. They said, Lord, please don't do that. Not anymore. I've had enough. David's going through something horrible. For thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. There's no soundness in, soundness in my flesh because of thine anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. Let me just make a statement to you. Do you understand there are many people in America today sick, physically, because of their sin? Do you believe there are people sitting right here in this building this morning that are sick because of their sin? Oh, we won't go there. We have a loving God who's just, and God does not bring sin. The devil does. You're right. But God can remove a hedge, can he? Mm-hmm. He can remove a hedge. There is sickness here today in the bodies of God's people because God's people have sinned and rejected God. But we don't believe that. Because we don't have God, we, we, don't, we don't have God anymore as God is good, the devil's bad. We don't have God as white and pure and the devil's black. We have a gray area. The world has taught us there's another place you can be in God. God says you're either for me or you're against me. We just said, no, we're just sort of in the middle, God. We sure do love you. But sometimes we mess up as sinners. You don't understand that, God. I'm, I'm not perfect, right, God? So I'm going to sin sometimes. I'm just in the middle, and I know God's love is going to cover me. You really? 
That's a lie of the devil. I'd rather you be hot or cold, white or black. Because if you're not, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. And every person who plays that middle game somewhere with God, they're going to get spewed out of God's mouth. He's going to reject them. It's going to come a time whenever God's going to say, enough is enough. And we're all going to die and we all can't wait to get to heaven and we all get up there and we're in line to walk in the gates and God says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I do not know your name. We don't believe that because we do come to church on Sunday morning. We do sing the songs. I mean, after all, I'm a member of the choir. What do you think? Yeah? And we pull out all of our blue ribbons to God to show him just how great we are and how we've worshiped him and how we've praised him. You know, we do all that and God says, I'm not interested in what's on the outside. I'm interested in what's on the inside. You've rejected me on the inside and made the outside to look good, but I'm smarter than that. David had played this game with God for a long time. He was very sick and he was near death. And he had covered it up. But all of a sudden, David realizes something. I'm sick because of my sin. I wonder this morning how many of us are sick because of our sins. It's not my sin. Heart trouble runs in my family. Thank you. Okay, fine. But my Bible tells me when you get saved, old things pass away, all things become new. Blessed be the name of the Lord again. We don't want to believe that. We'd rather use that as an excuse for our sickness when our sickness could be because of sin. I ask you this morning, do you have any sin in your life? Well, no, I just prayed this morning before I come in church. Well, bless God, and I hope you did. But that doesn't mean your prayer came from a heart that was penitent towards God. That's the prayer we pray before we get on an airplane, right before we buy the insurance. God, keep us safe and forgive me of all my sins just in case there's something there that I'm not sure about. God, you forgive me because this plane could crash. And if it does crash, I want to go to heaven. So forgive me. Amen. What's my seat number? God's great. God's good. Thank you for this food. Amen. And bless our hearts. Let's go. Let's eat. Pass the biscuits. We have routines and prayers. And they don't mean anything. They don't mean anything. Oh, they do to us. Because we're blind. And we don't see the sin. So we're just throwing things out there. We come to church because it's Sunday. We're gonna, so we throw it out there. We don't come here to worship. Because that's going to take too much time. We don't come here to get involved. I was sitting this morning. <clears throat> I thank God for the, for the altar service. I thank God for people that have come. But after it, was, <clears throat> after it was all over, and I thought then, I wonder how many people didn't come because they thought they uh, didn't come to pray with someone because they didn't think they were worthy to pray with somebody else. I wonder how many people didn't come because they've actually got sin in their life and they're condemned and they certainly weren't going to come pray a prayer for somebody else when they got sin in their own lives. I wonder this morning, do we have sickness and disease in our bodies that are crippling us physically because we have sin in our life that is crippling us spiritually and we don't want to admit that neither did David but let me tell you God allow you to stay in your sin just as long as you want to I've always told you God allow you to go just as deep as you want to in hopes that somewhere before you hit rock bottom you'll turn back up and look at him and say God forgive me David is in serious trouble he said my iniquities are gone over mine head as a heavy burden they are too heavy for me iniquity here is not sin my iniquities are going over my head my troubles my trials my sickness they've overflowed me about like water overflowing a dam a dam can hold so much water but when it gets too much it overflows and I, David's body, he says, Lord, it's my iniquity, my, my sickness and my disease. They've overflowed me. I've got more than I can stand, God. This is horrible. Don't you understand that David had the best doctors? He had everything. But they couldn't, be, they couldn't heal him. And after, after exhausting all of his efforts, he realized the problem is not outward. I'm treating a cough. 
I'm taking a cough drop so I can quit coughing. And it's time that I go to a doctor that doesn't treat the symptom of my disease, a cough, but treats the disease. David understood he was sick. And I'm sure he had been going around doing all these things trying to get well on the outside. It couldn't happen. It got worse and worse and worse. And something happened. Maybe a voice came to him. Maybe a friend came to him. The word of God got to him somehow, some way, and David said, oh, me. Oh, woe is me. My problem is inside. And my inner problem is causing disease and sickness on the outside. I've done everything outwardly to fix it. And I realize now it's my problem on the inside. And he said, Lord, listen, don't, don't, don't come against me. Don't rebuke me because of what I've done. God, don't pull yourself away from me for what I've done. God, I'm sorry. I realize now where my problem is. Don't let your wrath, the wrath of God, continue. It's not that God threw these sicknesses on David, whatever he was he'd going, whatever. It's not God did it. But God, I know you've opened the door. I know that you've allowed Satan to do it. And he's telling him, he says, I know God. David's not saying this, but he's saying, I know God that you're doing the same thing with me that you did with Job. When Satan confronted you about Job, you said, go ahead. Do what you want to, but my servant's gonna remain true. David had remained true even though he was in sin. He still understood God. He still hadn't withdrawn. He hadn't withdrawn from God as such. He had, but not the way he's thinking. And Job says, God, you know, I understand what's happening. And God said, okay, you can do anything to him but kill him. So he killed all those around him, put sickness and disease all over him. God allows things to happen in our lives. And he allows it to help us to understand our need for God. See, in these cases, David would have stayed in his sin had he not realized what was going on. So God, I understand you're involved in this. I understand you've allowed Satan to do something, but I've had about all I can take. You and I have not been close. We haven't been in real communion. I haven't been able to pray that real prayer between me and you, something's wrong. You're not my refuge anymore. You're not my strength anymore because I don't have any strength. You're not a present help to me anymore. I haven't felt your presence in a long time. I'm sick, I need help today. <clears throat> and I'm not talking about tomorrow. I need you today, God. So please, don't bring your wrath on me because of my sin. Don't let it continue. I'm asking you, Lord, to forgive me of my sin. He hasn't said it yet. That's exactly what he's going through right here. He said, for my iniquities, these troubles, they're over flooding me. I don't know how much more I can say. He was on the brink of death. And he understood that. And he knew, he knew death was imminent unless God did something. See, we're so quick when something happens to us physically to run to a doctor, to pick up a phone and call somebody, to call a druggist, to call this, call. We're so quick to do that. And there's nothing wrong with that if that's the second thing you do. But it's not the second anymore. It's the first thing we do. And the second thing, if that doesn't work, we may throw up a prayer to God. We need to, amen. We need to learn to come back and begin to go to God first in prayer. God says, I'm a jealous God. He doesn't like you putting the doctor ahead of him. He may allow you to use the doctor, and he's got good doctors and thank God for them, but only under his direction. And if we come to God and we say, God, look, I, I, I'm, I'm in trouble. I've got this, I've got that, and I don't know what's the matter, but I need you to help me. Then let God send you to a doctor. Let God prescribe medication for you. But you make sure you go to God first. We don't do that. And that's why David's in trouble. I can handle it. I've got good doctors. I've got good nurses. I've got good portions, potions. i got this. i got that. And it got worse and got worse and got worse and got worse. There are some of us that's been suffering for many, many years. And the root of that has sin, is sin. But we don't recognize it because we've lived with it so long. I'm not saying that every disease and every sickness is there because you've sinned. But how do you know it isn't? All this is is nothing but a search sermon. Search your hearts. Because it could be true. Do you understand that we could have hidden sins in our lives? 
Can you understand that you, you could have sins in your life that you committed 30 years ago and never got forgiveness for? Never think about them? And like a cancer they've been on the inside eating away and eating away at our body until our bodies are nothing? Nothing. And now we suffer from all kinds of disease and all kinds of sickness, all kinds of things going wrong. And it's because of old age. It's because of the way I lived in the past. It's in my family. It's in this, it's in that. And God says, no, why don't you really look somewhere else and see if there's not something else there that you need to be aware of? And you think that's silly? I kid you not. When I'm on my deathbed, I would really encourage one of you to come to me and say, Danny, let's pray. Is there any sin that you're aware of? And I'd say no. Well, then let's just pray there's not one there's been covered up. Oh, that's crazy. Really? No, I'm asking one of you to do that. Because we don't ever know one word that we said wrong to somebody. A look that we made wrong to somebody. A decision that we made we thought was right was wrong. It's there. We're not aware of it. It sort of sneaked in. We covered it up. Went on by and I'll pray about it later and later never came. You know, sort of like we do. I've been sick. Well, pray for me. I'll be praying for you. Walk off and never think about it again. We're quick to say the words, but we're very slow to fulfill them. There may be things in our lives that's there that we've forgotten, but God hasn't. Oh, but I've done too much good for God for him to worry about. No, you can never do enough good for God because you can't earn your way to heaven. Amen. Amen. It comes through the blood of Jesus Christ through the forgiveness of our sins. So we need to examine ourselves and look at it and see if there may be something in my life that's causing this. And God, I need you to reveal it to me. He said, I, I'm, 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 I dread God's anger. I even have fear of the future. I'm not even sure about heaven. I've got a heavy burden. It overwhelms me. God, I'm feeble, I'm weak, I have a great sorrow. I'm in continual agony. I have mental suffering, body suffering. And those two I know work together. I'm in great depression, great weakness, great exhaustion. I'm being tortured. This was David's prayer. He finally understood something that I'm afraid many of us don't understand yet. I'm the reason that I messed up. <laughs> I'm the reason that I'm in depression. I'm the reason that I have such body agony. I'm the reason that I'm sick all the time. I'm the reason that I don't feel like worshiping God. I'm the reason that I don't feel like going to church. I'm the reason. It's not because of the way the church treated me. It's not because that you don't like the pastor. It's not because you don't like the word. It's you. Something's wrong in your heart that's causing you to reject the things on the outside. And God says, all I want you to do is come to your senses and realize that there are other things in life than the physical things. It is the spiritual things. And we've got to make sure those are taken care of. He said, for my loins are filled with a loathsome disease and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and I am sore and I am broken. I have roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. This quietness of my heart. David is saying, Lord, I haven't even been able to talk about it. I've done everything I know to do. I've taken all the advice I've been given. But I haven't done the one thing that was necessary. I haven't examined myself. I haven't looked at me. I haven't understood that this devastation in my life has come 
because I have sinned. I'm just going to stop here. And um, I didn't mean to do it, but we'll finish this tonight. And I hope you'll come back. Because America is sicker today than they ever have been in their life. We blame everybody for everything. We think that violence, we think that our self rights, we think that our freedoms, that our opinions are more important than God's. We think that what we want to do is more important than what God wants us to do. That we get focused on a wrong, that we get focused on something that is good and wholesome and we make it wrong. We make it wrong. There's nothing wrong with doing it. It's just the way we do it. It's how we do it. It's when we do it. And it's gotten inside here like a canker worm. It's beginning to eat away. Little by little. And as it eats away spiritually, our body gets weaker and weaker. Because we don't have God as our refuge anymore. God moves that hedge. Little ants start getting under. Little things. And they start eating. And we grow weaker and weaker. But we deny that we're sinners because we can justify what we do as being right. We can justify that comes from a reprobate mind. We can make ourselves believe I'm okay because I'm better than she is. I'm okay because I come to church. I'm okay because, and we do that, and we're covering up this thing in here that's eating us alive. Then one disease, one sickness after another, and we rush to a doctor, we rush to medicines. We don't pray really anymore about it. We, we say, Son, God, I need you to touch my body, amen. All right, let's go. It's just like a prayer from food. We don't mean it, we just say it. We've gotten away from sincere conversation with God. We've gotten away from praying with one another. You know why we don't pray with one another? We don't believe it. Somebody says, I'm sick, would you me in prayer? We sure will, I'll be praying for you. And we never do it again. Whereas if we really believed it, we'd grab them right then and pray, wouldn't we? Because what they're saying is, I need it now. That's what David said, I, I, I need it now, God. But we don't have an urgency to do that because we've been suffering so long, why should we pray for somebody else? That's a trick of the devil. Because see, we can be sick and our heart be right. And that's where God really uses us. I just encourage you today to think about these, this this afternoon. And we'll come back tonight and we'll look at it a little bit farther. And I want to challenge, you, challenge every one of you today to think about your own self. Maybe it's time that you examine yourself and realize that there could be something in there that's wrong. If we can get that thing out, then we can see recovery coming. But no, that'll never happen unless you yourself admit it. Hunt for it. Spend some time in prayer this afternoon. Father, I've asked for your direction. I've asked for your power. Because without it, this is going to be just another sermon. Without it, God, it's just going to be some more words. And people will walk out of this building never once examining themselves. God, there are some of us who have been so sick for so long that we don't no more believe in the healing power of God than we believe in anything else. Oh, we'll say it. We don't believe it. There are people, God, and it's, it's reproach on Kettle Creek Church. I'll tell you that. But there are people that sit in this building, service after service, that are desperately hurting but will never ask for prayer. Never ask for prayer. 
Truth is, they don't believe in it anymore. They'll never say that. It's the truth. Forgive us. Forgive us as a church because we have failed you. Forgive us as an individual because, Lord, we have just turned to something besides you. But you've given us this sermon today to help us understand that there is a way that we can get back to the strength of God. God is our refuge, our help, and a very present. We can get back there if we're willing to do it. And I pray that you would take each one of us today and direct our hearts. Let us spend some time in prayer today and meditation and come back tonight looking for the answer in our own lives. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.